we are going to study linear geometry in R3. Now, linear geometry has to do with flat or not curved objects, things like lines and planes. But to begin with, we have to study vectors from a geometric point of view. Remember that a vector is a directed line segment. If we talk about a position vector, that means we are taking the one special case where we put the tail of the vector at the origin. That tip of the vector ends up at some location and the coordinates of the point are exactly the same as the components of the vector. And that allows us to make the following interpretation. Vectors are points in R3. You can then talk about collections of vectors. And when we talk about collections of vectors, we're going to talk about a very special case to begin with. Every multiple of a single vector v. Now this t right here is called a parameter. And what that means is, is it's a number, some real number. You can set it to be anything you want. R is actually infinitely many different vectors. So for example, it includes 0v, 1v, 2v, and it can go up as far as you'd like. You can have negative 1v, negative 2v, and as far as you'd like. You could take fractional multiples of v. You could even take irrational multiples of v. So you could have e times v or pi times v, etc. And this nice formula collects them all. What we're interested in is whether there's some sort of geometric pattern with this collection of vectors. And in fact, there is going to be, and it's best understood if we visualize things. Here's the vector v. So there's a 2v, and here would be a 3v. And remember, we're interpreting a vector as a single point. Down here would be a negative v, this would be 0v, this would be 1 half of v. And you could see that if I started filling in every different multiple of v, they're all parallel to each other. And if we take more and more and more multiples, connect the dots, and what we will find is that the vectors or the points organize themselves as a line that goes through the origin in the direction of v. And this is our first linear object. This line extends out to infinity. The larger I take that number in front of the v, the further out I push the vector. r is the position vector of some point along the line. You set the dial of t, it's going to produce a vector r that lives somewhere there. What would happen if I added some sort of constant vector? What pattern does this produce? Now, as always, we're going to build our 3D coordinate system. Here is the vector v, and let's take this to be the vector r0. So if we let t equal to 0, then what this formula produces is simply the vector r0. If I let t equal to 1, then what I'll get is an r0 plus a v. So if I think about the parallelogram rule, what this is as an instruction for how to add those two vectors, and the result will end up being right here, r0 plus v. Now, if I continue doing this, I'll get different additions here. I'll get 2v, and if I were to stretch out the vector to 2v, and if I were to use the parallelogram rule again, what I would find is another vector right there. I could extend it to the negative direction, so there would be negative v, and if I were to use the parallelogram rule here, this would be r0 minus v. So if I kept playing this game over and over and over and over again, what I would find is a new pattern, a shifted line. 
the origin has been moved up to R0. So it goes through R0 and it's in the direction of V. So let's say that V has components A, B, and C. R0 has components X0, Y0, and Z0. And let's say R is X, Y, Z. Now to be clear, these two are vectors you know. This is an unknown vector. This corresponds to coordinates of points on the line. What I'll have is x, y, z is equal to x naught, y naught, z naught, plus t bunches of a, b, and c. Now using vector properties, I can combine those two vectors on the other side to get x naught plus a, t, y naught plus b, t, and z naught plus c, t. If I equate the components, what I'll find is that x equals x naught plus a, t, y equals y naught plus b, t, and z equals z naught plus c, t. Up here, this is going to be called the vector parametric form. It's a vector form because you can see the equation contains vectors. It's parametric because it's in terms of this letter T. These are going to be called the scalar parametric forms. I could eliminate the parameter T from each equation. So I could solve each equation for T and I would get the following. Now, this is a set of three different equations, and these are called the symmetric forms of the equation of a line. The symmetric forms are not very important or useful, but we can put them here just for completeness. So let's talk about a line that goes through the points 6, 1, negative 3, and 2, 4, 5. If I draw a standard 3D coordinate axis, down here would be the point 6, 1, negative 3, and up here somewhere would be 2, 4, and 5. What we're claiming is that there's a line that goes through those points. The vector parametric form tells us any point on that line can be located by the tip of this vector Let's say this point right here is our R0. So we'll take R0 to be 6, 1, negative 3. Now, V is a vector in the direction of the line. One simple way of getting this V is just to subtract the coordinates of those two points. I could call this vector R1, and that would be 2, 4, and 5. And that means that the vector V would simply be R1 minus R0. That's the vector that's points between those two points, 2 minus 6, 4 minus 1, 5 minus negative 3. This ends up giving me negative 4, 3, and 8. So that means the equation of this line could simply be written as 6, 1, negative 3, plus T into negative 4, 3, 8. Using vector properties, I can get the scalar parametric form. It would be 6 minus 4t, y would be 1 plus 3t, and z would be negative 3 plus 8t. Now I could also get the symmetric form. x minus 6 is negative 4, y minus 1 is 3, z plus 3 is 8. Now, a useful understanding is to do with the intersection of lines in R2 and R3. It's possible for lines to intersect. You could have lines that touch at a single point, so there's one intersection, or you could have lines that are essentially overlaid on top of each other. And in this particular case, you would have infinitely many solutions because the two lines are touching at every single point along them. But lines don't have to intersect. You could have parallel lines. And when lines are parallel, 
they have no intersection. It's also possible for lines not to touch in a different way in R3. You could have non-intersecting lines, but they don't have to necessarily be parallel. This little loop that I've drawn is meant to signify something called a skew line, where they are not parallel and they do not intersect. So we will talk about two lines in R3. The first one is given by this. These are the scalar parametric equations. Line 2 is given by these scalar parametric equations. Don't be thrown off by the letter S or T. These S's and T's are supposed to be a parameter. I'm just trying to use a different parameter for each line because they don't necessarily have to take the same value. The vector equation 1, 0, 2 plus t into the vector 2, 3, negative 1. Whereas in this particular case, negative 1, 4, 1 plus s into 1, 1, 3. Remember that this vector and this vector talk about the direction of the lines. These vectors are not multiples of each other. So for example, if I were to take this second vector and multiply it by a 2, it would turn the first component to a 2, which would match the second vector here. But if I were to take that second component and multiply it by a 2, it would not produce a 3. If two vectors are not multiples, that means these vectors are not parallel. And if they are not parallel, that means the lines are not in the same direction. Do they intersect? Now, in order for us to determine whether they intersect, what I'm trying to find is x, y, z that's on both lines. Is this even possible? I'm going to take the x equation for the first line and try to set it equal to the x equation for the second line. So if I repeat this for all of the entries, here's what I get. Now I'm not interested in the x, y, and z anymore. This block right here is what I'm interested in. This produces what's called a linear system for the T and the S. This is a system that's going to allow me to determine if I can find two particular values of T and S that will make these equations all true. So the first equation would be 2T minus S is negative 2, 3T minus S is 4, and negative T minus 3S is negative 1. If you know matrix methods to solve systems, feel free to go ahead and use them. If you don't, you can solve this with some sort of combination of substitution and elimination like you learned in high school. We'll label these equations 1, 2, and 3. Now from equation 1, what I'm going to do is solve for s and I will find that s is 2t plus 2. From equation 2, s is 3t minus 4. If I set those two equations equal to each other, what I find is that t is equal to 6. Now from equation 3, I would find that t is 1 minus 3s. Now instead of trying to do this same thing for another equation, what I'm going to do is substitute this into one of the other equations. So let's say I'm going to substitute this into equation 1. So I'll get 2 into 1 minus 3s. Subtract s is negative 2. So I'll get 2 minus 6s. Subtract another s is negative 2. And that means negative 7s is negative 4. So s is 4 sevenths. So that's the only way to make that true. Now what I have to do is sub both of these results into any of the equations. And I'm just going to choose equation 2 to see if the equation is still true. 3t minus s is 4. 
If I plug in the value of t, I'll get a 6. If I plug in the value of s, I'll get a 4 over 7. Does this, in fact, equal 4? The answer is no. That means there is no solution to this system. This is the only possible value of t and s that made the other equations work. Plugging them into the last equation shows me that there is no answer. So that means the lines do not intersect. And because they are not parallel, it tells me these lines are skew lines.